Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Era Viewpoint. Today I wanted to talk about a couple things that you can check on a VRF system that's in heating mode. And it's not the same sort of things you'd be checking in cooling mode. Um, and I'll get into that really quickly here. So, in case you're wondering, uh, we are referring to air source units. These, the things I'm reading from are the third edition of the L-Gen manual uh, in the 10 and 12 ton range, which is really common uh, where I'm at. Those are commonly twinned, you know, 20 ton, 24 ton systems. Um, okay, if you go to that manual, there is a page, and I don't see this in previous ones. It's kind of cool that Mitsubishi included it because it gives us some valuable information, a little bit of insight. So if you're looking at the page number at the bottom, it's page 179, and if you're in a PDF, it's 190 of 428, where I'm looking at. And this is section 6-8, um, operate, operation characteristics uh, and refrigerant charge. And so this is a preface to talking about adjusting the charges on the system, which is kind of cool. So, it says it's important to have a clear understanding of the characteristics of refrigerant and operating characteristics of air conditioners before attempting to adjust the refrigerant amount in a given system. The following table shows items of particular importance. Okay, if you've ever wondered where does the refrigerant go? Why does the accumulator fill up? Why am I getting overcharged stairs? I wasn't getting them a month ago. This is pay attention to this. So, number one, during cooling operation, so this is in cooling mode, the amount of refrigerant in the accumulator is the smallest when all indoor units are in operation. Under heavy load in cooling mode, the accumulator empties. Number two, during heating operation, the amount of refrigerant in the accumulator is the largest when all indoor units are in operation. And so under a heavy heating load, the accumulator actually fills. And if you think about it, a, a lot of the system, the high pressure side of the system that would have been full of liquid and cooling, becomes full of discharge gas, which is very spacious. It's, you know, doesn't, the, the same amount of refrigerant takes up a lot more space as discharge gas instead of as liquid, obviously. Okay, so I have a system, it's a little overcharged, let's say it's 10, 15 pounds overcharged. It did fine all summer because it was in cooling mode, it just ran high subcooling in the BC. Whatever, no problem, right? Well, it's not a problem until the accumulator overfills and now I have liquid going into the pickup tube. So what's gonna happen? Well, it's gonna affect my compressor temperature. The other end of the spectrum, is let's say I'm I have a leak and my system is low on charge well as we get higher and higher compression ratios which it's gonna actually get into this a little bit more as we get higher and higher compression ratios the temperature of the compressor increases and so if it's low on gas already and we start running high compression ratios that can put the strain we need and we can start seeing those high discharge temperatures so let me carry on here Next point, discharge temperature tends to rise when the system is short in refrigerant, which is true. We lose, uh, we lose refrigerant, our suction pressure goes low, we run high superheat, our density goes down, and the refrigerant running through the compressor doesn't have as much capacity to absorb heat, and as a result, we get very hard, hot, high temperature discharge gas. Um, if you're looking at a diagram, so I'll put that up, we are measuring our discharge temperature at TH4 on the compressor. And I'm pretty sure that's the same on K's, J's, L's, and probably N's, and all those generations. Okay. Change in the amount of refrigerant in the system while there's refrigerant in the accumulator has little effect on the discharge temperature. So, if you think the discharge is high because it needs more gas, but if there's liquid in the accumulator, you're not gonna change anything. There's, you're just adding more liquid. It's still boiling off at the same rate, it's not gonna change. Okay, 
the higher the pressure, and this is interesting, I think this is poor translation, but it says the higher the pressure, the more likely it is for the discharge temperature to rise, and the lower the pressure, the more likely it is for the discharge temperature to rise. Now I think it means the higher the head pressure and the lower the suction pressure. To translate, as you run lower and lower pressures, which you will in heating mode, because in very cold ambient conditions, the evaporator outside to absorb heat will, will be a lower evaporating temperature than whatever your outside ambient is. And as we're gonna talk about here as, as one of our items to check, the system is also going to ramp up and run a very high condensing temp by design in order to move heat to the system. So as those two things happen, the discharge temperature will typically rise. Okay, so what is normal discharge temperature? Well, we need to keep it under control, uh, typically under 203, and that's on that same page down below in the symptoms section. If your discharge is creeping up over 200, 203, 205, you're starting to get into the danger area. There's something going on with it um, beyond just, you know, it's running hard. Um, and actually there's another section where it talks about what temperature does it have to reach at TH4 before it actually stops what it's doing and slows the compressor down. At, if it hits 239, it doesn't even care if it hit its target temperatures or its target pressures, it's gonna start backing the compressor off. Um, Okay, so we're gonna check our compressor temperature. We're looking at TH4, we don't want it over 200. I mean, if it creeps up 205, sometimes that's normal, but it should come back down as the system modulates. And so we're not looking for, did it go above that temperature in one screen? We wanna see the trend. Is it holding that temperature for an extended period of time? It's a symptom that we can look at and say this is not normal. Um, at the low end, so going back to the situation where we talked about if I've got too much refrigerant in the system, the accumulator fills, and now liquid is getting into my compressor, what are the symptoms going to be? Well, on these newer systems, they've added a new sensor. This is TH15. It's mounted on the compressor itself, on the body, at the oil line, so at the bottom of the compressor. And it's measuring the shell temperature in the crankcase, essentially. And so, what we're going to see is we're going to see liquid falling down into the oil, flashing, absorbing a lot of heat, and we're going to see low crankcase temperature, but then we're also going to see very low superheat in the discharge line. And you calculate the crankcase superheat by looking at TH15 and comparing it to TE, and we calculate our discharge superheat by looking at TH4 and comparing it to TC, which is our condensing temp. There should be, in both of those places, at least 18 degrees of superheat. 18 degrees or lower, it will actually start throwing overcharged errors. And if you've ever seen a 1600 error or a 1500 error, what that means is it saw 18 degrees or less superheat in one of those locations. Okay? Six to, if it sees that temperature, it will actually shut off and if it sees it a certain number of times, it will proceed from a 1600, which is a preliminary error to the, the 1500. Okay. So we're gonna look at the temperature of our compressor. Not too hot, not too cold. Typically 160 to 180 or to 200 is your normal range. If you're in that range, 180, 190, even 200, you're usually fine. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna look at is the condensing temp because in heating mode the compressor is going to it's going to switch in cooling mode the head pressure is being controlled by the fans outside they ramp up to bring the head pressure down well now it flips now the suction pressure is being controlled by the fans outside and the compressor is going to ramp up to hit its target condensing temp and if it can hit and hold that it's going to you know build the pressure build the heat and move the heat out to the coils so what is its target? From the factory, it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit, which is it's pretty high. We can see that in the same manual, so I was quoting from earlier. If we look at, this is page 144, or if you're in a PDF, 155 or 428. 
down, about halfway down. It says depending on the capacity required. This is section 5-2-6, frequency control. Depending on the capacity required, the frequency of the compressor is controlled to keep constant evaporating temperature um, of 32 degrees TE during cooling operations and condensing temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 418 PSI during heating operation. That's its default. Uh, there's a note that says the maximum frequency during heating operation depends on outside air temperature and dip switch settings. Now there are dip switch settings that can change that from 120 up to 130 um, to be a little bit more aggressive on the heat. So I've seen systems that have both and so what I would say is 120 to 130 is your normal range. If you're in heating mode and you're not there, you need to ask yourself why. Am I having a hard time accepting heat? Is the outside coil frozen over? Is it plugged up? Is it are the fans having a problem? Am I low on refrigerant? Is my compressor not ramping up? What is it that is keeping me from hitting my target condensing temp? So first thing, compressor temp, not too high, not too low. Second thing, in heating mode, we should be 120 to 130 on our TC. Okay. Next thing we want to look at, we want to turn our eyes to the indoor coils because that's where the heat's got to go. And so on the indoor coils, we're looking at TH3. TH3 is, so on those indoor coils, you have a temperature sensor at each end of the coil. TH2 is at one end, the end with the metering device, and TH3 is at the other end. So in cooling mode, TH2 is the inlet, TH3 is the outlet, in heating mode it reverses and TH3 becomes the inlet, TH2 becomes the outlet. And so you can compare those temperatures to, to see what temperature difference you have, calculate superheat, etc. So we're looking at TH3, which is the inlet. The hot gas is coming in, in on this end on the ICs or the indoor coils. So what should that be? Well, we want it ideally you know, hotter than our condensing temp, but we have a pressure drop from inside to outside. And if you look at PS1 and PS3, you see that pressure drop from outside to inside. And then we have a lower, you know, a middle pressure zone to, to induce the flow back into the DC. Um, and so if you're curious what that, what, what pressure our act, we're actually having in those coils, a good guess would be PT3 which is the, the condensing temperature in that middle pressure zone. Um, so I'd like to see them typically above PT3. Um, typically, you're gonna see the coils anywhere from 130, I've seen them as high as 150, 155. If you're in that range somewhere, I'd say you're doing well. If you're sitting there with a 102 degree coil and the, the compressor's not ramping up or nothing's changing and it's just holding there, that's a problem. You're not moving very much heat. Those coils need to get up to the higher temperatures. Um, and so for me, if I'm not seeing the heat on those, that TH3, what that's telling me is even though I may have hot discharge gas, it's thin. It's, it's, it's not heavy, you know, heat laden discharge gas. It's thin, wispy, and I'm not building heat. It's just a lot of a lot of heat coming from the compressor. That indicates an issue to me. So we want to see high temperatures on the indoor units on TH3. Um, and give them some time. They'll usually go through a preheat. It takes time to build that temperature. Okay, so fourth thing, fourth thing we're looking for, we want to make sure the outdoor coils are defrosting. If you're having a unit that's just not doing it, it's not building pressure, super low suction pressure, and you're just like, what is going on with this thing? Get outside to the unit, go take a look at it, and physically, visually verify that it is clearing the frost. I had one that had built a lot of frost, and it went clear, and I wondered why, and I come to find out that one of the sensors that was involved with the defrost termination had failed. Replace the sensor, cleared the frost, no problem. But you're not gonna get proper operation if it isn't clearing the frost. You need to keep the air paths through the outdoor coil clear to absorb that heat to build the pressure. And so it's very common to see what I call banding, which is basically strips of frost in different thicknesses on the outside coil. And I'll show a picture of that. Um, that's normal. I mean, it doesn't need to clear it right then. It's when it starts to build up and it has certain metrics and maybe I'll do a video on 
what exactly brings on defrost on these systems and what terminates it, but you want to make sure it's not getting extreme, it's not getting thick, it's just little bands of, of frost like that. And the fifth thing is you want to see that it's holding set point. Now I can understand if, if a system is, is trying to catch up or if it's got something else going on, dirty filters inside for example, but a proper op properly operating system, good airflow, should be able to hold 10, assuming it was sized correctly. I mean, that's a different thing. And so how do we know if it's holding temp? Well, we look at the inside coils again. And so we're gonna look at TO, or two, I don't know exactly what it stands for, but basically that's the set point. So wherever they're inputting what they wanna run it to, TO is the set point. So if they say, I want 72, it's gonna show up to 72. The second is going to be TH1. TH1 can be different points in the system, but it's your controlling temperature. From the factory, it's set up to be the return air sensor. If you add a thermostat and you flip dip switch, I think it's S1-1, then that TH1 is now the wall thermostat. But whatever it is, it's the controlling temperature. And the unit should run until TH1 is more or less the same as TO. And if it's not, I mean, you give it a little leeway, a couple degrees, but if it's five degrees off set point, 10 degrees, even three or four degrees, something's up. There's a reason it's struggling. Now, so if I walk up to a system and the compressor's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's holding 120 to 130 degree condensing temp, and I got coils that are satisfied and the ones that are calling are running nice warm, 130, 140 degree coils, and all my units outside have clear coils except for little bands. My system's good, and I will give you 99% odds that that system is not having any issues. It doesn't have leaks, it's not overcharged, everything's working pretty well. So if you need to go kick the tires, check these five things first. And then if you're still having issues, well, that's when you start digging into it and you can you know, work your magic on figuring out what is going on with this system. So until next time guys, I really appreciate it. If this is the kind of content you like, uh, like, subscribe, share this with your friends, um, or share it with somebody that's, that's gonna be working on these that could use you know, some pointers. Um, and if there's content you'd like to see or something you run up against you'd like me to talk more about, share it in the comments and I will put that video together and we'll, we'll learn together. So until next time, my name is John, this is Vera Viewpoint. Thank you.